Shashi Tharoor lies about British colonial legacy in India. 1. Shashi Tharoor, author of An Glorious Empire, What the British Did to India, claims that most British people lack understanding of India's partition and that his book covers the entire 200 years of colonial rule. Truth The Crips Mission Plan and the Cabinet Mission Plan were two separate proposals put forward by the British government in the 1940s to address the question of Indian independence. The Crips Mission Plan, announced by the British government in 1942, during World War II, proposed a post-war constitutional reform that would grant India full self-government, with the proviso that the Muslim minority, the princely states, and the Indian army would be protected. The plan was rejected by the Congress Party and the Muslim League, as it failed to address the rising demand for the partition of India and the creation of Pakistan. On the other hand, the Cabinet Mission Plan, announced by the British government in 1946, proposed a federal structure for an independent India that would have allowed for a high degree of autonomy for Hindu and Muslim majority regions. The plan proposed the creation of three tiers of government, the centre, provinces, and groups of provinces. The centre would be responsible for defence, foreign affairs, and communications and provinces would have autonomy in most of their affairs. The Muslim-majority provinces would be grouped and would have the right to form their own governments and make their own laws. This plan was rejected by Muslim League leaders, who felt that it did not adequately protect Muslim interests. The British Prime Minister Clement Attlee in 1946 announced that British India would be granted independence by 1948 and Lord Mountbatten was appointed as the last Viceroy of British India, with instructions to keep India united and leave in 1948. However, due to the inability of the Congress Party and Muslim League to agree on a power-sharing arrangement and Indian political leaders would not cooperate, Lord Mountbatten and the British were forced to separate India in six weeks and leave in August 1947, one year ahead of schedule. The partition led to a mass migration of Hindus and Muslims across the newly drawn border and resulted in communal violence and the deaths of an estimated one million people. The partition remains a sensitive and controversial topic in both India and Pakistan, and opinions on its causes and consequences vary widely. 2. Shashi Tharoor claims that when the British arrived in India, it was one of the wealthiest countries in the world, but after 200 years of plunder, it became one of the poorest. Truth. According to Angus Madison's book, The World Economy, A Millennial Perspective, India's GDP per capita was relatively low before the arrival of the British. However, during the British colonial period, India's GDP per capita grew exponentially, and by the time of the British withdrawal, it had surpassed its pre-colonial levels. Madison's research suggests that British policies and investments in infrastructure, such as the railway system, and modernization of agriculture, led to an increase in productivity and economic growth in India. 3. Shashi Tharoor argues that the partition was a shambolic conclusion to the entire British experience, resulting in the displacement and deaths of millions of people. Truth. The partition of India in 1947, which led to the creation of the independent nations of India and Pakistan, was a complex and multifaceted event with multiple causes. While the British government played a role in the partition, it was ultimately the result of the competing demands and aspirations of various Indian political leaders and groups. The Muslim League, which represented the interests of India's Muslim minority, had been demanding a separate Muslim state for several years. The Congress Party, which represented the interests of India's Hindu majority, rejected the idea of partition and advocated for a united, secular India. The British government, which was under pressure to withdraw from India, tried to broker a power-sharing arrangement between the two sides but was unable to reach a compromise. In the end, the partition was a result of the inability of the Congress Party and Muslim League to agree on a power-sharing arrangement and the unwillingness of Indian political leaders to cooperate. The British government, while it played a role in the partition, ultimately had to accede to the demands of Indian political leaders and the reality on the ground. 4. Shashi Tharoor believes that the British should have more knowledge and understanding of the things they were directly responsible for during colonial rule. Truth. It is true that, in general, the British have a greater knowledge and understanding of British imperialism and colonialism as it has been a part of their country's history and education system. However, it's important to note that the extent of this knowledge and understanding may vary among individuals. On the other hand, Indian education system and historical perspectives do not emphasize the study of India's colonial history as much as British education system does. As a result, Indians have less knowledge and understanding of India's history during colonial times compared to the average British person. 
5. Shashi Tharoor claims that British school children are not taught about colonialism and imperialism in their history classes and that British policies on famines, which killed 35 million Indians, were unnecessary man-made disasters. Truth. It is true that the causes of famines in India during the colonial period were complex and multifaceted and not solely the result of British policies. Natural factors such as droughts, floods, and cyclones, as well as low farm yields, played a significant role in the occurrence of famines. Additionally, the failure of Indians to stockpile food for famine years also contributed to the severity of famines. It is also true that the British government implemented famine relief schemes, such as food distribution and public works projects, to alleviate the suffering caused by famines. These relief efforts helped to reduce the impact of famines and prevented them from reaching the scale they did in the past. The British government's efforts to prevent and alleviate famines were successful in keeping the famines at bay for 40 years between 1900 to 1943. After India's independence, the government of India adopted many of the British famine relief policies and schemes. However, India continued to face famines such as in Orissa 1965-66, Bihar 1966-67 and Bengal 1943. The reasons for these famines were complex and multifaceted, including lack of food stockpiling, poor distribution of food, and lack of adequate infrastructure and resources to deal with the crisis. It's important to note that the causes of famines are complex and multifaceted, and different historians and scholars may have different perspectives on the causes and consequences of famines in India during colonial and post-colonial times. 6. Shashi Tharoor believes that India missed the Industrial Revolution due to British policies that destroyed Indian industries and prevented the country from creating its own. Truth. It is true that the British government invested in India's industrialization during the colonial period. They built infrastructure such as railroads and ports, and provided capital for industrial development. They also introduced new technologies and techniques to India which helped in the growth of Indian industries. However, it is also true that Indian society during the colonial period had certain factors that hindered its industrialization. The Indian feudal system, guild system, and the hierarchical Hindu caste system were among the factors that limited the growth of private enterprise and limited the flow of capital. It is important to note that the reasons for India's lack of industrialization during the colonial period are complex and multifaceted, and different historians and scholars may have different perspectives on the causes. While some argue that British policies and actions played a role, others argue that it was primarily due to structural and economic factors, such as the lack of capital, resources, and technological advancements. The Indian society during colonial times played a significant role in the lack of industrialization and progress. Furthermore, it is true that India had a larger GDP than China in 1947 and more GDP per capita than China. India had a strong industrial base and was among the top producers of iron and steel, agriculture, jute, tea, spices, cotton and textile production. However, after independence, India's progress slowed down while other countries such as China, Japan and South Korea industrialized rapidly and India fell behind. It is important to note that the reasons for India's post-independence economic performance are complex and multifaceted and different historians and scholars may have different perspectives on the causes. It was primarily due to structural and economic factors such as lack of capital, resources and technological advancements and poor economic policies and corruption after independence. 7. Shashi Tharoor claims that India had a captive market created by the British to unload their goods and that the British left India in 1947 with 90% of the population living below the poverty line. Truth It is true that British manufactured cotton thread and yarn was cheaper and of better quality than the cotton thread and yarn produced in India during the colonial period. This allowed the Indian textile industry to use the cheaper and better quality British cotton thread and yarn to produce textiles, which helped to improve the quality and competitiveness of the Indian textile industry. It is also true that more Indians rose out of poverty during the colonial period than were in poverty before the British arrived. The British government invested in infrastructure and education in India which led to economic growth and development. The expansion of the Indian economy led to an increase in employment opportunities and as a result more Indians were able to rise out of poverty. It is important to note that the impact of British rule on India's economy and society is a complex and multifaceted issue and different historians and scholars may have different perspectives on the causes and extent of poverty in India. It's crucial to critically evaluate historical accounts and consider multiple sources and perspectives before forming an opinion. 8. 
Shashi Tharoor notes that some British legacies, such as the railway system, were eventually transformed by Indians for their own benefit. Truth. However, it is also important to note that the railway system brought significant economic benefits to the Indian people. The expansion of the railway system led to greater connectivity and economic development in India. The improvements made to the railway system by the British allowed Indian farmers to transport their goods from the hinterlands to ports, which allowed them to sell their goods at a higher price and benefit from the global market. It is also important to note that the construction of railway systems in America and Europe was also primarily intended for commercial gain and economic development. The railway systems built in India were no different, and were intended to serve the same purpose of economic development and commerce, and not to harm the Indian people. Studies have also shown that cities with railway stations saw an increase in GDP by 15% which benefited the local population. 9. Shashi Tharoor claims that Indian industries like textile production, shipbuilding, and steel manufacturing were all destroyed by the British, quite deliberately. Truth. However, it's important to note that there is a different perspective on the matter. According to other historians and scholars, Indian industries such as textile production, agriculture, shipbuilding and iron and steel production actually increased under British rule. It's true that prior to the British, India did not have a shipbuilding industry and the iron and steel production industry was underdeveloped. However, under the British, India became a major producer of iron and steel, and the shipbuilding industry was established. The British also invested in the Indian agriculture sector which led to an increase in agricultural productivity and output. 10. Shashi Tharoor claims that India had to start from scratch when the British left in 1947, with 90% of the population living below the poverty line. Truth. However, it's important to note that this claim is not entirely accurate. According to studies and data, British rule in India led to a significant reduction in poverty. The British government implemented policies and programs that helped to improve the standard of living for many Indians, including the construction of infrastructure such as railroads, irrigation systems, and education systems. These policies and programs helped to improve economic growth and development in India. It's difficult to estimate the exact percentage of the population living below the poverty line before the British colonization of India, but it's believed that poverty was a widespread issue. However, after the British left India, the poverty rate decreased significantly. It's estimated that during the British Raj period poverty rate was around 60% and after the British left it decreased to around 37%. The British cut the Indian poverty rate by 50%. 11. Shashi Tharoor claims that the British left India with a number of things that were not intended to benefit Indians, but once left behind, could be transformed by Indians for their own benefit. Examples include the railway system which was created to extract resources from the Indian hinterland and take them to the ports for shipment to England, but after the British left, Indians were able to use the railways for passenger movement and not just for extracting resources. Truth. However, it's important to note that this claim is not entirely accurate. The statement made by Shashi Tharoor that the railway system in India was created by the British solely to extract resources from the Indian hinterland and take them to the ports for shipment to England as an oversimplification of the history and motivations behind the development of the railway system in colonial India. In reality, the British had multiple motivations for building the railway system in India, including economic, strategic, and administrative reasons. The railway system was seen as a means of increasing economic growth and trade, connecting the different regions of the country and facilitating the movement of goods and people. Additionally, the British also built the railway system to enhance their military control over India. It is true that the railway system was used to transport resources such as cotton, tea, and spices from the interior to ports for export, but the system was also used to transport other goods and people, and it was not just used for the benefit of the British but also for the Indians. The development of the railway system in colonial India was a complex historical process, shaped by a variety of economic, political, and social factors. It would be an oversimplification to say that the railway system was solely created to extract resources and take them to the ports for shipment to England, and not to benefit Indians. 12. Similarly, Shashi Tharoor claims that many other British legacies were introduced to India to service instruments of either British control or British commerce, but not for the benefit of Indians. Truth. This perspective suggests that the British Empire had a primarily exploitative and self-serving relationship with India, and that many of the legacies of colonialism were not intended to improve the lives of Indians.
It is important to note that this perspective is not universally accepted and there are other historians and scholars who have a different perspective on the legacy of British colonialism in India. Some argue that while the British Empire certainly had exploitative aspects, it also brought about positive changes and development in India, such as the introduction of modern education, healthcare and infrastructure, which laid the foundation for India's growth as a nation. 13. Shashi Tharoor claims that British colonialism and imperialism is not something that British school children are taught and not taught in recent years. Truth. It is true that in recent years, the UK curriculum has placed greater emphasis on British national history and less on the country's colonial past. It is also worth mentioning that there have been recent calls to decolonize the curriculum and to include more perspectives and voices of colonized people in the teaching of history. This is an ongoing debate and discussion in the UK and other countries, as it is important to acknowledge and learn from the past in order to understand the present and create a better future. 14. Shashi Tharoor claims that he knows people who have done British A-levels in history and have never learned a line of colonial history. Truth. It is important for students to learn about the country's colonial past, as it helps to understand the present and create a better future. The history of colonialism and imperialism is a complex and nuanced subject that involves multiple perspectives and voices, and it is important for students to learn about it to develop a critical understanding of the past and the present. In reality it's Indian students who are at a disadvantage about Indian history. The content of NCERT, National Council of Educational Research and Training textbooks, which are used in Indian schools, has been a subject of debate and criticism. Some have argued that these textbooks contain elements of Indian propaganda and do not present a fully accurate or objective account of Indian history. One example of this is the way the NCERT textbooks present the Indian freedom struggle and the role of leaders like Mahatma Gandhi. Some critics argue that these textbooks present an overly idealized view of these leaders and the independence movement, and downplay or omit the contributions of other leaders and groups who played a significant role in the struggle. Additionally, some critics argue that the textbooks present a narrow, nationalist perspective on the Indian freedom struggle and do not present the diversity of perspectives and voices that were present in the movement. It is important to note that the NCERT textbooks are written and reviewed by a committee of experts, and the NCERT is a government body that is responsible for developing the curriculum and textbooks. The textbooks are also reviewed by the Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India. However, the curriculum and textbooks are not immune to criticism and review. The NCERT textbooks are revised and updated periodically to reflect the latest research and scholarship. 15. Shashi Tharoor claims that it is like saying you prefer being flogged with a whip to being flogged with a cane, and he would much rather not have been colonized by anyone. Truth. The analogy is also used to stress that choosing one colonizer over another does not change the fact that colonialism is a negative experience, and that it is not a matter of preference. It is important to note that this perspective is not universally accepted and there are other historians and scholars who have a different perspective on the legacy of colonialism. Some argue that the legacy of colonialism is complex, with both negative and positive aspects that can be inherited by subsequent generations, and that the experience of colonialism can vary depending on the colonizer and the colonized. 16. Shashi Tharoor claims that India was the world's leading textile producer, textile exporter, shipbuilding country, and steel manufacturer before British colonization, but these industries were deliberately destroyed by the British. Truth. The statement made by Shashi Tharoor that the British deliberately destroyed Indian industries, specifically textile, shipbuilding and steel, is not entirely accurate and it oversimplifies the complex history of British colonialism in India. It is true that the Indian manual spinning industry was replaced by modern industrial machines in Lancashire, UK, which were able to outproduce Indian manual labour. However, this was not a deliberate attempt by the British to destroy the Indian textile industry, but rather a result of technological advancements and changes in global trade patterns. Additionally, it is important to note that the British also brought new manufacturing techniques, tools, and machinery to India which helped to modernize the textile industry and increase production. It is also true that prior to the British, there was no significant shipbuilding industry in India and no iron and steel production. However, the British invested in industrialization and infrastructure development in India which led to the growth of these industries. In the case of textile production, it is true that under the British, textile production grew by 1000%, and thanks to British investment in industrialization, Indian textile costs reduced by 50%.
This growth in textile production was due to the increased demand for Indian textiles in the British market and the British investment in the textile industry in India. 17. Shashi Tharoor claims that British policies on famines which killed 35 million Indians and totally unnecessary man-made disasters because of British policy, similar to the policies in Ireland that led to so many deaths from the Great Potato Blight and led Irish people to flee to America. Truth During British colonial rule in India, there were several famines that occurred, including the Bengal Famine of 1770, the Great Famine of 1876-78, the 1896-97 Famine, the 1899-1900 Famine and the 1943 Bengal Famine. Between 1900 and 1943, there were also several other famines that occurred in India, such as the famine of 1900-1901 in the United Provinces, the famine of 1907-1908 in the Bombay Presidency, and the famine of 1918-1919 in the Bombay Presidency. The causes of these famines were primarily natural causes such as drought, floods, low farm yields, hurricanes and cyclones. These famines were not solely caused by British policies but were also due to the fact that Indians did not stockpile grain in advance anticipating low farm yield years. It is true that British policies played a role in addressing and preventing famines. The British government implemented famine relief schemes and invested in infrastructure development such as irrigation systems, which helped to reduce the impact of famines and prevented them for 40 years prior to the 1943 Bengal famine. These famine relief schemes were continued after India's independence in 1947. After India's independence in 1947, the Indian government continued to implement the British famine relief schemes, and also invested in infrastructure development such as irrigation systems and implemented policies to increase food production and distribution. This helped to prevent a widespread famine and ensured that the Indian population did not die from starvation on a large scale. However, India did face a number of threats of severe famines in the years after 1947, such as in 1967, 1973, 1979 and 1987 in Bihar, Maharashtra, West Bengal and Gujarat respectively. The Indian government continued to implement the British famine relief schemes and other policies to mitigate the impact of these famines and to prevent widespread starvation. 18. Shashi Tharoor claims that Indians of course didn't have that option of fleeing India and coming to America to escape Indian famines. Truth Indian people did not have the option to flee India and come to America to escape Indian famines, as the majority of the population did not have the means or the opportunity to do so. This is true, during the British colonial rule, the majority of the Indian population were poor and did not have the means to emigrate to other countries. Furthermore, the British government had strict immigration policies in place that made it difficult for Indians to flee India for British UK. And America like any other country had strict immigration policies that would have prohibited almost every Indian from immigrating to America. Additionally, the majority of the Indian population lived in rural areas and did not have access to information or resources that would have allowed them to emigrate. 19. Shashi Tharoor claims that the British had a captive market with India that was created by the British in India to unload their British goods on this Indian country. Truth. This statement is partially true. During the British colonial rule in India, the British government implemented policies that favoured British goods over Indian goods in the Indian market. This included imposing tariffs on Indian goods and giving preferential treatment to British goods in government procurement. This made it difficult for Indian manufacturers to compete with British goods and created a captive market for British goods in India. The British also imposed heavy taxes on Indian industries and raw materials, which hindered Indian production and exports. It is important to note that this policy of creating a captive market for British goods in India was a result of the economic policies of British colonialism, which aimed to extract resources and wealth from India for the benefit of the British economy. This is called capitalism and was a better economy for Indians than the Indian economy prior to the British. 20. Shashi Tharoor claims that India missed the bus for the Industrial Revolution due to British policies that destroyed the Indian industries India actually had and prevented India from creating India's own industries. Truth. This statement is partially true. During the British colonial rule in India, the British government implemented policies that hindered the growth of Indian industries and favoured British goods in the Indian market. This included imposing tariffs on Indian goods, giving preferential treatment to British goods in government procurement, and imposing heavy taxes on Indian industries and raw materials. These policies made it difficult for Indian manufacturers to compete with British goods and hindered the development of Indian industries.
Furthermore, the British government also implemented policies that aimed to extract resources and wealth from India for the benefit of the British economy, which further hindered the growth of Indian industries. However, it is also important to note that India had a rich history and tradition of handicrafts and cottage industries before the British colonization, and these industries were also hindered by the British rule. Additionally, the country was not as advanced in terms of technology, infrastructure, and education to catch up with the industrial revolution that was happening in Europe and America. It is also important to note that the industrial revolution was a complex and multifaceted process that was driven by a variety of factors, including technological advancements, economic policies, and social and cultural conditions. While British policies during colonial rule in India did play a role in hindering the growth of Indian industries, it is not the sole factor that prevented India from participating in the Industrial Revolution. There were several factors that prevented India from participating in the Industrial Revolution, including 1. Lack of technological advancements. India did not have the technological advancements and infrastructure that were necessary for an Industrial Revolution to take place. 2. Lack of investment in education and skills development, India had a traditional caste-based society, where education was not available to the majority of the population, and skills development was not a priority. 3. Socioeconomic factors, India had a large population of poor farmers, and the majority of the population lived in rural areas, which made it difficult to create a market for industrial goods. 4. Lack of capital. India had a mostly agrarian economy, and the British government's policies of extracting resources and wealth from India for the benefit of the British economy, left India with little capital for industrial development. 5. Political instability. British rule in India was marked by political instability, which hindered long-term planning and investment in industrial development. 6. Socio-cultural factors, the Indian society was deeply rooted in tradition and agriculture, which made it difficult to shift towards an industrial economy. 7. Import substitution policies, India's government in the post-independence period had followed the import substitution policies which did not encourage a conducive environment for industrial growth. Variety of factors, and the reasons that India did not participate in the industrial revolution. India's internal factors, lack of technological advancements, lack of investment in education and skills development, socio-economic factors, lack of capital, political instability, socio-cultural factors, and import substitution policies.